Welcome, welcome. My name is Alana, Director of Coaching Business Development here at Keller Williams Legacy. Say that morning, you know, to watch this later. Um, and it's not just me teaching today. We have a special guest teacher. Hello, my name is Doug Rubin. I'm the incoming broker for you all. I'm excited. This is my very first class that I'm teaching, so I'm really excited to get into it. Ask him all the questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come at me. Come at it. But just to share a little bit. So Doug um, has had his license, been a licensed agent, and attorney for how many years? Not to age yeah. you in front of people. Yeah. 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 So, so I have an attorney and attorney. background when I've done the full time agent thing as well. So I'm really going to ask questions. Yeah, so absolutely, right. absolute wealth of knowledge. We'll oh, yeah. be reaching out to all agents over time, not overnight, over time. Yes. Um, to get to know everybody. Yeah, and everything. So I'm excited to have you in here because what better person to talk about contracts than yeah. a broker? I mean, come on. All right. So what we're going to be discussing, there's a lot of information in a short amount of time. Take as much notes as you possibly can. Uh, we'll be going over contract formation, how to put things in a certain order, um, fee simple versus leasehold, the addendas, exclusive right to sell. By the way, today is all about the listings, not the buyers. We have a separate class every month about the buyers on our YouTube channel. You can absolutely, and if you haven't watched it yet and you don't wanna wait until July's class, on our YouTube, which is on our resource page I sent you, on our YouTube channel, we have the buyer contract class on there. So I recommend putting on your calendar Yep, two hours, sit there with a glass, whatever you like, and a pen and paper, and watch the class. You don't have to wait until July, because guess what? Take it again in July, take it again in August, take it again. You said it's the buyer contract. Buyer contracts, yep. Um, we're gonna talk about the importance of ex inclusions, exclusions, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. I'm gonna dive right in. I'm gonna start with the most important thing. Why is the exclusive right to sell the most important? Yes, it locks you in. It locks you in. So here's what you're going to get from these, these classes, these listing contract classes. What's interesting is when you think of a contract, you think black or white. In real estate, it's a little bit different. Yes, it is a contract. It is black and white. However, as an agent, there's gray areas. What that means is we will share with you best practices based on what we have done and based on top producing agents and the studies we've done through top producing agents and how they fill things out. You as an agent can determine as you grow in your business what works best for you. Now I'm going to give you examples of that as we go through this so you know kind of what I'm talking about. As we go through, if you have questions, please take yourself off a of mute, ask them in the room, be like, hello, ask them, um, this is your time. Again, it's a lot in short period. So ready? Right. I'm also, we're not going to sit here and read the contracts to you because we can all read. <laughs> right. Um, and it's also demonstrating you do not read contracts to your clients. Number one, you're actually not allowed. You're not returning. So you're technically not allowed. You can, you're allowed, you're the only person. <laughs> but we are not allowed to read a contract to a person because we're not returning. But you can go through certain sections and talk about what it means when we have questions. Not to mention, who in the world has time to sit there and read 45, 47 right. pages of somebody? Yeah. They will fire you before they even hire you. Yeah. You go to my house and read something to me and spend more than an hour with me and you don't just have me a pen, I'm sorry I'm not hiring you. And part of what you're doing is you're demonstrating your expertise, right? If you're able to sort of navigate and point out the important pieces, what they care about, what they can read on their own, maybe emphasize the important pieces, that's you showing that you know what you're talking about. So you can set a really good impression that way too. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so let's dive in. The first section of the exclusive right to sell, and by the way, this is the one contract that when you go, hey, welcome, when you go to a listing appointment, the exclusive right to sell, again, best practices. You can do what you wanna do. I'm just sharing best practices. 
the exclusive right to sell is the one contract that I recommend you fill out in full minus two sections that I will show you in a minute to print and bring with you because more they are more likely to sign and commit to you when you have it in front of them as opposed to walking away and saying I will email it to you or I will send you electronically. However, after they, after they uh, fill this out and sign it, then you can say, great, I'm going to send you everything else to sign electronically. Are you comfortable with that? Again, that is a best practice that we choose. All right, so you have the seller's names. Every single person who is selling the house, meaning the names on the deed, have to be on this sheet and have to be the ones to sign. Very, very important. If you are working with, let's say, a divorced couple who cannot be in the same room with each other, but yet they own a house together, you do have to set up two separate meetings if they don't want to meet together. They both have to have their names on here and they both have to sign. Even if they're like, no, 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 like I'm just, I'm just gonna just do this. No, because Whoever didn't sign is going to come back and be like, you can't sell it, and then you're supposed to be done. Um, address, information, you don't need a fax number. I don't even know why they put fax on here anymore. I really hope they update that. It's 2022. Um, broker information, that is Keller Williams Legacy. Our office information, office number has to be on here. Listing agent, that's you. That's your name, Sherry Banks. You're filling one out today. She has a listing we're working on right before this class, right? So that's you. Um, your direct line. Again, full phone number, who has those these days? Uh, email address. Property listing, again, Keller Williams, Keller Williams Legacy. If you are the agent, you are the representative, but every listing, is actually owned by the brokerage. It's yours. That's your listing. It's your name on the sign. It's your thing. Our logo's on it. Um, but the actual ownership of it? Yeah, it's, it's, it, that's why you would need to sort of work for it. Protection of it? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's basically. It's more of a protection for you. Yes, they're just, yes, they provide all the oversight to make sure that everything is done correctly. Um, obviously, what's the address you're listing? Unhelpful. Is it in fee simple or ground rent? Uh, Baltimore City and PG County are the two locations in Maryland have the, who have the majority of ground rent properties. If the owner does not know, believe it or not, some owners actually theory, like they actually don't know. They're like, oh, I lived here 10 years. I don't know. That's scary. Um, any properties outside of Baltimore City, Baltimore, or PG County are almost always feasible. When, if you don't know, and if the owner doesn't know, uh, you can go on to, um, thank you, SDAT. If you go to Google, type in SDAT, it's the first site. It will show you, it shows you who's on the deed. It shows you information about the house, and it will tell you. So Maryland Land Records. Oh, Mer uh, MD, MD Land Rec. If you go to Google and type Maryland Land Records, it's the first site as well. Google's your best friend in real estate. You know that. Every day I'm like, I oh, Google it. But that's how you, so there's only a few things you really need to check on the, you want to see what deed is kind of in the land records already. All mortgages, deeds are recorded mm -hmm. in the county circuit court. So you, you click which county you're in, you type in the name or the address, it'll pop up. That'll tell you the names that you're looking for. So if there's an extra name on there that you're surprised by, you asked about that. And there should also then be reference to the ground rent. Have you guys heard of ground rent? Do you know what that is? Okay. It's, it's a wacky thing. It like only exists, which I just had to research this. I think it's basically Baltimore City, parts of Pennsylvania, and like Hawaii. It's like, Almost a little bit of PG County. It's not like a thing that exists almost anywhere. But no. We get to, but it's not that unusual. And mm -hmm. honestly, it's not that big of a deal as long as people are educated and understand, explain what it is. But 
If we get rid of it out, what do you mean? I don't know it. What do you mean? Like, and you don't want, and you don't want surprises on there, right? You never want a like. If you're a listing agent, you don't put ground rent in there, but then the buyer's agent finds out this ground rent, right? I was like, oh shoot, oh, let me update this. But if you're working with a buyer, you're looking at houses specifically in Baltimore City with them, and the property doesn't say either way what it is. Unfortunately, you will come across agents who don't fill things out properly. They don't have trainings like this. Um, they use the wrong forms. There's a there's a whole boatload of stuff that happens in real estate law. Um, all of you will know the right ways because you're sitting here today and on Zoom. So moving forward, listing terms and agreement. So the effective date does not mean the date being listed. So for example, so share your equal. I'm just going to use some, like yours as an example. Okay. Since you have this listing coming up. So for example, you're filling out forms today to have them signed. So the effective date would be today. Because you were, or if you're going to see him in person, whether you're sending, now you know him personally, so you could send this electronically or be in person. That's up to you for this one. So let's see your meeting with him tomorrow. I'll put the effective date tomorrow. That just means it is effective that I am going to work on your behalf and represent you when we do this day. You could meet with a seller, go to the appointment, this happened to an agent I know, and when you go there, you realize, oh my God, they're a reporter, like true, like they'd be on TV, like that, that show, right? And they're not listing their house anytime soon because they have to declutter and it's probably gonna take them like five, six months. That's what happened to this, this agent. The agent went out, person wanted to sell. They realized that they could not list the house the way it was because they were a true order. And they got the list agreement signed, effective that day. They then coached them through, okay, hire, junk, hire the hunks for junk guys and do this. And here's what you want to do. And let's get a pod in your, one of those pods for your driveway to put stuff in. So they coach them on different things to, to help them get ready. But all the paperwork and everything was done. So when they were ready, they could go. So again, the paperwork just says, I can now work on your behalf. It doesn't mean I'm going to put it on the market tomorrow. Continue until, that's the expiration date. Very important date because that's the date that's going, going to go into bright MLS. And if you put that date out, let's say 30 days, I don't recommend that. But if you have somebody who's like, I'm only going to hire you for 30 days. Okay. I might still take it. It's where you'll have that. But if you come across that, that, that date, let's say I put an expiration date of July 30th. If you haven't changed the status in right MLS, if it hasn't gone to under contract, if it hasn't closed, if something, if it's still active, right MLS will automatically make it expire. And then it's free for all for agents to attack it and get that new listing. That's the agents who call expires. A good rule of thumb is anywhere between six months minimum. If it is a property typically over like 900,000 to a million plus a year minimum. And it's usually luxury properties can take up to a year or so to sell. Well, then it's fine. Okay, so this goes into bright MLS so they know when the dates and everything. Yep. That's how they found it. Yep, exactly. So if you did have a short term period like that and you saw that it was about to expire. If you guys are working through some stuff and everything's going fine, you proactively get an extension for this, right? Because you don't want this to expire. So it's a free for all. Like all this stuff. So, you can, so you can always extend it. And the reason why we'll put a longer period of time is basically really explain this. Some people will look at this and say, what do you mean it's going to take a year to sell my house? So you just sort of coach them and say, look, it's, it's, this isn't how long I'm expecting it to take. This is just us giving us this time frame. So that we don't have to keep filing extensions and keep extending this thing. I know, by the way, we're about to go over how you would fire me if you really run out of brains. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm just Now, the next part is the termination, right? You have, here's the thing don't leave things blank. I can't tell you how many times I've seen, because as a coach, myself and Rachel, we, were, we will put our eyes on your contracts 
you know, if you have an appointment coming up and you want us to look at it ahead of time, make sure everything's correct, make sure it's formatted correct, please let us do that. I've seen so many agents who don't do that. They guess and they get their client and then in trouble. We are here for a reason, use us. So the next one is, if you don't like me, fire me. That's basically what that says. So can terminate with how many days written notice? You choose the date, it could be five days, three days, the reason why I put five, five is kind of a best practice, but that allows you as an agent to try to save it. A lot of times people will terminate agreements with us because there was maybe a miscommunication of some sort. You might have not explained something that they were hoping to know, so they made an assumption that we didn't do it. So I will explain to my seller, Doug, hey, listen, if, if things aren't working out, if this is, you know, yes, I know it says a year, but guess what? If this is not working out for you, first I would ask if you would please reach out because maybe maybe there's something I didn't know that I need to know and that's feedback for me to help me improve and, and help me hopefully continue. If not, shoot me an email, five days notice. So now if he sends me an email, you'll get, you'll get people firing you and happens in this business. And guess what? You're going to fire people as well. It just happened. We're real estate. It happens. And that's not a bad thing. Um, so if he sends me an email, I'm going to immediately pick up the phone. Don't email that. I'm going to immediately pick up the phone and be like, hey, Dolly, I got your email. Listen, totally respect whatever your decision is. I just want to know is there anything that I could do differently for my next seller that you would recommend? Anything that, that could save this as well? I just want to see what he says. He might be like, you know what? My sister just got her license. I want to use her. Okay. All right. I lost to the sister. Or you might be like, you know, I thought you were going to communicate with me every day and you did it. Okay. Well, I have my feedback Fridays, but absolutely I can add a daily communication to you. Are you okay if it's a quick text though to give you updates on the showings? And we move forward. So the termination part, don't just put one day. It doesn't give you time to save it. Listing price. George, I see your question. I'm going to answer that in one second. I love that question. George asked, the reason it was with the 900. There is a reason. Yes, I'll share that in a minute. The listing price is the blank that you're going, you're going to have that blank when you go to the appointment. Because the conversation about listing price is the appointment. Now I'm gonna kind of get into listing presentation. That's an entire separate class that we hold. Attend one of those. Um, however, this is blank because you do have to determine with them and agree on what are we listing for. You do not, we as agents do not determine price. The sellers do not determine price. They think they would. They have a thought in mind. The market does. So we have a price in mind because we did a CMA. The sellers have a price in mind because they own the house and everybody does. And they talk to their aunt, they, they saw their neighbor sell their house. So then you sit down at their kitchen table to determine the price and write that. George, to answer your question, the reason why, why 900, most buyers, when they start looking, they typically go on sites like Zillow, realtor.com. And when you go on their sites um, and do home searches, they give home searches in ranges, right? uh, 200 to 299, 300 to 399. It's usually those sites, the searching capabilities are in ranges. So if somebody doesn't want to go to 300, um, so if a buyer does not want to look for something in the 300 range, and I put it as 250, 250,900. More buyers tend to see it. It's actually like an algorithm thing online. I don't know how better to explain that. Um, Can I play devil's advocate a tiny bit? Please. By the way, this is just the best practice. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of different strategies, and there's definitely no correct answer. A lot of people would rather see 
two ninety nine nine instead of three hundred. Like that's why Macy's psychology. Yeah, that yep. gives a psychology to it. Yep. The other side of the coin is if I want to put it right at three fifty, potentially you're capturing people that are searching from three hundred to three fifty, and those doing three fifty to four hundred. Mm -hmm. So you might then capture two different ways. So it's really six of one half a dozen of the other. It it's is. not. You're going to have to kind of feel it out. And, and honestly, your seller might have a strong opinion. Like, no, I want it to be right at three hundred. I want it to be two ninety nine nine. Yeah, hundred percent. This is. I mean, if you lined up. 50 agents right now, every single one of them does something different. There is no right or wrong. So when you're sitting with your seller and you're having the pricing conversation with them, you're like, hey, what price do you have in mind for your house? And Doug's like, three good. And now if I'm sitting there with the CMA and the market's saying that it really should not go above 345 at max, or say 340, 340 at max. I'm going to share with them the market, the CMA, what that says, facts. There's no emotion in pricing. The seller will have emotion. But there's no emotion in pricing. So I might say, well, you know what? The market says this. Why don't we list it at 340? So I might come back and mess with his head a little bit. <laughs> right? Because now he's like, ooh, mine. Yes, it's a little bit more. I like it. So you kind of play with that number. If you as a person like to shop that way, you'll probably start. Like I like to shop. Like if something is like $49, I won't buy it. If something's 50, I typically will. It's just the way my psychology works. It's also important to note that you're not wedded to this number just for the purpose of this agreement. So some people for the agreement will say 350. And then while we're getting the house ready and we're getting photos, they might say, Oh, you know, I, I saw this new listing, now I want to increase it to 360. You can absolutely do that, but it is important to get a number down here just so you have a completed agreement and you can start that dialogue. Everything's changed. Editable. Everything's editable. Do, do, do you mind if I follow up on that real quick? Um, is Would there be any advantage to going, say, 350,500 compared to 350,900, or it doesn't really matter. It's just semantics at that time. The, the only advantage is that the seller's like, can we do 500 on it? Sure we can. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> sometimes they're like, oh, you know, can we increase it by X? So I'm not gonna tell people, like, I'm not gonna take money out of your pocket. If we can get that extra $500, we're gonna try to get that extra $500 yeah. for you. Um, some of it you can, Find a resource that you like and point them to it. There's there's some resource that's going to say, no, you should do 399.9 because there's psychological reasons. And there's another article that'll say that Zillow algorithm would prefer this number. So just like find something that you believe in and sort of pitch it and back it up with some data. And if they feel strongly that it's very slightly different, like yes. And I'll be and I'll be totally honest. When you start really sitting with a number of sellers, when you go on these listing appointments. You will learn one of the biggest ahas that you will come across is as much as you can sit there and all of you can sit there and prep and plan. And this is it. And this is the price. And here's all this. And you'll spend hours debating in your head. And then all of a sudden, you'll, which is a complete waste of time, for that. so just throw it out the window. Because you do a CMA, which when you practice, your first CMA is going to take you a little while because you've never done it. But when you practice it, like I can do a CMA in about five minutes. Like we're gonna do a CMA on, on that house. It'll take about maybe that one's like sounds like we're gonna have to play with a little things. It might take 10 minutes. When you practice, you're gonna get really fast. Again. So prepping for your appointment, don't overthink the price. Just be like the CMA says it's a range. And just have a range. Start with a range. What is that range? Because then when you go out to the house, you can have tour of the house and be like, Oh, this is definitely not the high range. This, and your these are thoughts you're having privately in your head. Don't say them out loud. Or you're gonna be like, oh, like this. Again, saying it in your head, not out loud. So you have this range, you sit down, you ask the person what their thoughts are, you come up with a price. They are actually gonna be the ones who are gonna be like, what if it's like 355 or can it be like 359? Sure, why not? Yep. So, hey, if it gets them to sign, you know what? Absolutely, we can start there. Yes, let's sign today. 
Yeah, so don't overthink the whole number thing because the sellers are really going to be the ones that drive that ending number. Okay, moving forward, showing instructions. On average, if it is a home that people live in, most people do like a two hours notice. But this is a conversation you'll have with the owners. If it's vacant, you just put the word vacant. But this is again based on the owners. Do they have pets? Do they need more time? It's a, it's a conversation with them to be able to fill the section up. Now, something really important. I'm not going to read these paragraphs, but one thing I want to make sure everybody does is really read through this. Don't wait until you have your very first listing to then go to the appointment and then have be sitting there and have a person go, "What is this marketing on the MLS?" And then you have to sit there and read it before you tell it. Read these ahead of time. Most, I will tell you, most people do not ask a lot of questions um, if they trust you in the appointment and have the relationship. You just hand the pen and they'll start signing. But you do want to be prepared for that attorney who's across the table who's probably going to sit there and be like, I want to take some time to read through this. But it's also uh, to my point about demonstrating the knowledge. If yeah. You make it clear that. You have a procedure, everything is backed up by best practices, and you are familiar with these contracts. If you gloss over something, they're going to gloss over it. If you emphasize something, they're going to emphasize it. So it's just about we're going to feel for this to get better at it. Page two. Now, here's the thing I spent a little more extra. I, more extra great English. I spent more extra. more extra. Yeah, I spent way extra time on this first page. The next few pages are going to go faster because it's a lot of paragraphs that they're just signing and initialing um that to be honest are extremely i'm gonna go through this but everything else in these next seven pages are very self-explanatory so if you see me go a little faster it's because sit down read this and you're like oh okay that makes sense so right here broker may submit may not submit the property by and through display and mls it is rare that somebody will ever say and want to initial that you want the property on the multiple listing service because then they're going to get more buyers, period. This is like if you're representing a celebrity that insists on anonymity or something right. really wacky. Right. For the most part, just say, this is dumb to sign because you want us to advertise your property. Same thing with C, right? May or may not submit you know, through internet websites, I mean, social media websites, et cetera. Everybody wants their, minus the celebrities or the people who need, need secrecy of some sort, right? It's very rare when it does happen. 99.9% .9 of everyone else will be like, well, yes, look at the living daylight down this thing. And some of the specific points about like, let's talk about here, the ability to like leave a review. All right, so that's, that's what we're just about to get to. So there's certain things that are clearly like if you want it on Zillow, you basically are consenting for them to use their estimate and for technically somebody could be like a review on your property, which I've never seen before. Yeah, I've never seen that either. But it's something that it exists. You need to make sure that you allow that to happen so that yeah. it's on Zillow. So, so these are always lie. right. So almost always these are seller seller authorizes. Seller authorizes. So the seller saying, yes, put on social media. Yes, mark it out, which automatically means yes, people could in fact leave reviews. They don't, I've never seen it, but they could. Um, authorizes to do it coming soon. It, again, it is rare that somebody doesn't want to come in soon. Doesn't mean, now here's the thing, they can initial this, it does not mean you have to get on MLS as you come to. So, my rec the, the best practice is initial it because if we're able to, it doesn't, get, doesn't mean we are doing it coming soon, but if we're able to based on timing, we will because it drums up more interest. It's demonstrating your knowledge. Talk about the benefits of coming soon, yeah. but then you just straight up say it like, if we can't get the photos lined up on time and we need to be on one market on X date, then we just won't do coming soon, but it's going to be at least have the option. 
Now this one's a newer one that was added in just a few years ago. Consent to discuss other properties with buyers at seller's open house. So what this says is you're hosting an open house for your seller and all these buyers are coming. You're getting them to send a lead sheet because those buyers are now your future buyers for leads. On average, over 90% of houses are not, are not sold by open houses. Open houses look great to sellers. Sellers love it because they're like, ooh, an open house. But the true secret part of an open house is that's your future leads. That's your future business. We don't tell buyers that. I mean, we don't tell our owners that, right? But that's really what I'm thinking. Um, that and also drum up market. Like there might be an owner in that neighborhood of another house who comes to that open house who could be a seller. So it also drums up potential more listings. Consenting to discuss other properties. This is up to that seller. Um, I'll be honest. Whether they authorize or doesn't don't authorize. I'm just gonna share my opinion. This is strict. This is not compliance. This is strictly my opinion. When you're representing that owner, that seller, okay, you are my seller. I am doing the open house for you. You are my clients. You are all my buyers who just came into the open house. I'm gonna get to know you. Hey, what we'll brings you by? Oh my God, you live in the area. How long have you been looking? Relationship. Sign this form for safety purposes. That's actually why they signed the form in the beginning. That's actually why we created it. We recommend it. Um, here's information, any questions, let me know. Then after the open house is done, I'm literally going to lock up the house, go to my car, go to a coffee shop locally and be like, and call everyone those buyers. And now I can talk all about the house, other properties, try to get them as a client. So whether somebody authorized or doesn't authorize, I, it doesn't matter if I can. Yeah. I mean, I mean I because I'm not, I'm not sitting in an open house going, hey, have you seen the house down the street? Or what do you think of this? There are pluses and minuses to that because technically that buyer could say, oh my God, I love this. But, you know, are you aware of any other properties in the neighborhood? By your seller authorizing this, you could in fact say, actually, you know what? There was only one other property and I already went on the contract. There's nothing else on the to one of them. Nothing can be left blank. They have to always sign one or the other on everything. The rule of thumb with contracts is read through it, sit there, and if it's blank, something's missing. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of an uncomfortable one because sellers at first should be thinking like, oh, why would my agent be talking about other properties? But the way I sort of sell it is, I represent you, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, Everything that I say and do can only be in your best interest. But if somebody else said, asked me about something down the street, I don't want to be like super awkward. I want to be able to maybe even say, oh, but this property is better than that property because X, Y, Z. So it just gives you more tools as well to help us out. Now, you'll see here a bunch of it, like you'll see here an initial spot under home security. They're initialing that they read the paragraph. That's all that means. You'll see a bunch of this. this is also, by the way, on the buyer's contract. We're not talking buyer's contract, but a lot of contracts you'll see a lot of initial sections underneath paragraphs. And if you really read it, it simply says they're acknowledging that they read the paragraph. They're not initialing that there is home security. They're just initialing that they read it. Again, as a coach, I do come across a lot of these contracts where they leave all those blank. And then they just have to simply call their son, like, oh no, let me send this over. You forgot to initial two sections. All right, the section everybody always longs to see. Burger conversation. First, I have to give I have to give a training disclosure. Um, what do I call this? The disclosure, the, the asterisk. So let me give the asterisk before we go into number 14. In real estate, agents per Maryland commission, agents cannot talk to other agents about commission. So for example, let's say that Sherry puts her house in the market. Doug has some buyers who work on it. And Doug, as fellow agent, anywhere, Keller Williams or anywhere, comes over to Sherry and be like, hey, I see you have this house. What's your total commission you're charging? 
if Sherry was that agent, which none of you are, and please don't be this agent, but if Sherry was that agent that does exist out there, she couldn't carry. Oh, I have an answer for that. Is there something else I can help with? That was weird. That was my British guy talking. You could technically, again, don't be this person. Don't be this agent. I know this agent. You could call Maryland Commission and get him a huge fine. Because in the state of Maryland, I don't know other states, in the state of Maryland, agents cannot talk commission with other agents. As a buyer's agent, you'll see what you're getting. It's on a list. As a listing agent, you are the one setting the tone for you and the buyer's agent. So you determine what you want your commission to be. What I'm going to talk about in training, we are allowed to talk about. So we can talk about as coaches and trainers. Agents can't walk across the room to other agents and ask. Yeah. The, the bigger context is that like NAR is being sued right now. Basically, there's an allegation that everybody's in cahoots with each other. We're all agreeing to set a good price for everybody. But that's not the case. And we want to make it clear that y'all can charge whatever you want. We can we can set forth what we think is a good idea that you guys all do for your own best interest. And as a coach, I coach agents on the value of your service that you're worth and how to talk about your value of service. Right. But don't yeah. go to like a meeting with other realtors and say, hey, we should all be making sure we get 6% right now, just to protect everybody. Like, that's not a conversation that we're allowed to have. Yeah. So the, um, the listing agent and the buyer's agent can have two different conditions. It's okay. I thought you were saying, okay. So mm -hmm. tip on, uh, so I'll say it this way. So the listing agent sets the total. So you'll see here 6% of purchase price. 6% does not mean that if I'm the listing agent and you're my seller, that I'm getting 6%. Now, if I end up getting the buyer as well, then yes, I will. That's not always how it happens. Instead, that means that I am going to, as a listing agent, take 3.5%. Don't ever split it in the middle. You're worth way more than that. Not to mention, as listing agents, we're the one paying for photography, paying for marketing, we're putting out money. Buyers agents are not putting money to any of your stuff. So why, why should we? Standard is usually two and a half to buyer, whatever. So if, if this said 5%, it would be two and a half to demand. These are just examples. Yeah. Um, now, typically as a buyer's agent, it's per the MLS, because you'll see if you go to MLS, you'll look at listings and be like buyer's agent percentage. You will never know what the listing agent's rate. You cannot ask. So here's an example of one. 6% of purchase price plus a 495 flat fee. Now, that used to be called admin fee, then they changed to flat fee. I don't know why. It's the same thing. Um, some agents charges, some agents don't. As a listing agent, um, as a coach, I do coach agents. I'm putting in a flat fee, 395, 495. I see something 595. Choose a price you like. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Just so there's a stipulation to that. Having that, number one, offset your commissions. I'm sorry, offset your photography prices, right? You get that at closing. Don't get that off right, get that at closing. What that also does is it shows your value. You're worth it. Why not? Why, why don't you charge me? Example of mine back to that. Now, it also allows you when you go into the listing appointment negotiation table. I would much rather, if they're sitting there interviewing another agent and they're talking about, well, could you lower this? Could you do this? You know what? Let me wave that flat fee. I rather cut out 195. And by the way, never go from six to five. If you're negotiating, go to 575.75 or 5.5. By the way, the difference between 5.5% and 6% is typically an extra thousand dollars in your pocket. I'd rather not lower it by 0.5 and wave. And here's so you can wave it. You can choose to wave it. What you cannot do, you can't change the amount. There's no mean by that. You're my good friend. I love you. So you're 295. We just said you're a stranger, so you're 495. Ooh, you're in a bigger price property. Oh, I can get some money from you. 
You're six times five. That is not allowed. That's not allowed. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> that's obviously to prevent against yes. bias and discrimination, yep. right? If somebody's you are actually like that's huge fine. Hispanic, we want to make sure that you're treating those yeah. the same way. Well, that's a losing your license mentality. Yeah. So the permission you can negotiate the permission. Absolutely. I call it your value difference. So you always want to have it typed up ahead of time what you are going in with. So if I'm going in with 6%, then, and Doug is saying, so true story, I went to a listing appointment, they interviewed two other agents. Most people interview more than one. The couple said, well, 6% is kind of high. We don't have a lot of equity built up in our property. We interviewed these two other agents. They can do it the lower. They didn't tell me what the lower ones. They told me were. And I said, well, you know, here's what my offerings are. Here's what the services are before the process. And you know what? I am very confident in getting your house sold. More importantly, getting you to where you need the bigger house while that long. I know that I can get the sold for you and, and market it to get the buyers you want. I'm okay with going down to 5.5. Let me go ahead and do that. I'll just cross that out right at 5.5. Now, if they, this couple was like, well, this agent was four and a, like 4%. Like, can you do 4%? Okay. The second one would be like two and two. If you really think about it, if you want to do that um, Prior to going on an appointment, always know what you were willing to walk away from and what you were willing to negotiate down to. This one example was a, I don't know how we count this one example was a house in Hagerstown. That was a low price, it was 215000 house in Hagerstown, huge drive away from me. I was like, you know, the lowest that I'm willing to go is 5%, but I also know my services and what I can bring to the table. I also know my good negotiation skills to help negotiate to get you the best amount you can get, get you where you need to go. I don't discount my services because I don't want to discount the money you get. They had to make a choice. They want the discount person or the non-discount person. They chose the discount person. I walked away. I didn't get the listing. They never sold it when it's fired. Um, but that was my choice. I knew going in, I was not going to lose much. Do I know people who took way less than that because they wanted the neighborhood, they wanted to sign the neighborhood, and they knew they could get referrals? So you always need to know that ahead of time. But never start with it. That's your back pocket. Don't show them all your cards. Start with start with what you're worth first. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, good rule of thumb in this paragraph during the period of 90 days. Do you want to explain that over? Sure. So this is the I like to call it the don't be an a-hole and screw me over provision. Basically, totally stealing that. <laughs> if I list your property and bring you a buyer. You can't fire me at the 11th hour and try to save the commission. So this basically protects you from that. So if you bring, if they, if you bring a buyer during the term of the listing agreement, they cancel your agreement, and two days later they're suddenly under contract with somebody that they met because of you, they basically owe you a commission. So I like to say, like, start like. Everybody be cool, guys. Like, I'm not gonna screw you over, don't screw me over. Like, we're all on the same team here. Right. Yeah, so Again, is it by common that no? Is it, well, so here's the thing: it's hard to track and know. Um, a good rule of thumb of that blank is anywhere between 90 and 120 days. Pick a number you like. 90 is kind of a standard out there. Um, I will tell you that uh, one of the agents I coached a few years ago, this did happen to him. Unfortunately, it happened with his best friend since kindergarten. Uh, his best friend hired him as an agent. He had the 90 day clause in there. Went and saw some, it was actually on the buyer side of things. They had the same thing. Um, they went and saw some houses. His friend fired him. Basically, sent him an email saying, Thank you. I decided to go a different route. He then went to one of the houses to try to get a better deal and went back to a house that this agent showed him. To buy the house, he did end up finding it was his friend's kindergarten. He did end up finding out, so he came to me. We got the two brokers involved. The brokers got me. so we got the two brokers involved and negotiated out how he would still get some money off of it. 
He didn't get the full commission, but he did get some money. Unfortunately, he lost the entire apprentice and the very sad. Very sad. Very sad. Yeah. Um, so always protect yourself. Unfortunately, this industry doesn't matter who it is. Trust will be burnt. Things will happen. Everything is being writing or it doesn't exist. And regardless, that's kind of a culture where people think realtors don't do anything. They watch HGTV and all it's like, oh, we sell three houses. And then they made one offer and they're under contract. Like it's all easy peasy. Um, so again, it's protect yourself and in equal parts demonstrate your value. Because if you really bring a lot of value to the table, they're not going to pull this kind of money business, right? So it's about relationship building and professionalism. Number 19, or sorry, number 19, number 15, this is where you're designating what the buyer agent is getting. So again, we saw the total, like the total of 6% as this example. And here is where you're saying, this is what the buyer's agent is getting two and a half. All this information, when you get it, goes into bright MLS for that buyer agent to see. Not your side, but this side. As we scroll down, again, Really easy blanks. Was it they're gonna either initial was it prior to 78? Was it up during 78? Was it after? Or they're uncertain. Is this new construction? Or not new construction, sorry. Um, they don't know the date of construction. So again, always just when you see initial spots, highlighting it or put those little tabs next to it always shows your sellers what to initial or sign faster. For the staff to sign automatically tell those items to all. For these, um, this for when it gives options like this, um, it will give the tags, but then you have to say which ones are required. So you would be telling this person prior to 78 or during or after 78. Yeah. You know if not, they'll just start initialing everything. Yeah. yeah. You know it was built in 1950. You just activate the before 1978. Click box, and that's the one we'll click on. Home warranty again, they're just saying yes, I desire home warranty, or no, I decline. That's up to the seller. 2018, 2019, a lot of sellers were offering home warranties to help the sale of their house because it was a different market. Since 2020, honestly, it's very rare it happens, but it's very rare that sellers are like, yes, let me buy a home warranty for a buyer. Something to be aware of, though, is that, especially from a listing perspective angle, a lot of home warranties will protect the seller while it's on the market. So if you're going to be there, there's some risk of our sellers. Like, what I don't want is my HVAC to go up if I'm on the market for 60 days. And then they'll be willing to pay for that, that insurance as well. So that's one way to kind of pitch it. Not the interest rate. Um, common sense, I probably think one that they could uh, close the deal quick enough where they won't be there. Most, most sellers, these right now in today's market, most sellers are selling houses in two, three, four days. Okay. They're getting multiple offers. Why do they need to spend hundreds of dollars on a home warranty to incentivize more buyers? They don't. It's like six or eight dollars. But uh, exactly. But at this point, it does protect things as well. So there is a you know, if they think that something might break in the 45 days or six days between now and closing, if they're like, well, oh, I'm a little hesitant on this, some piece of equipment that I can't think of right now. Um, and all furnace, you know what? It's probably less expensive, and this might be a great incentive to get a home warranty or at least talk to a home warranty person, right? We've seen people at the front desk, uh, cards at the front desk, um, Anna Coleman, and also uh, Maureen. They're both at, uh, home warranty um, partners with home warranty companies. Um, so again, there are some benefits to it for a seller for protection loans. And this can change too. They just check one now, but if later down the line or after the inspection, they're like, oh, we have a really shit with this, then we can obviously do that later. Paragraph 23 is the most confusing for every single agent. <laughs> I highlighted the bottom section of this because this is really the section that explains it. So if any one of these apply, right, is it an initial sale of a new home? 
Um, has it never been occupied? I'm not gonna read all these to you. Yeah. But if any one of these apply, then they would initial is exempt. Exempt. Is exempt. Yeah, so the, the way I like to think about it, under Maryland law, you have to do these disclosures, okay? Except in very limited situations, like a foreclosure or a new construction that's never been lived in, a state sale. Like, if it's something weird, consult this list to see if it's exempt. But in almost every instance, it's not exempt, and you're going to have to complete the necessary disclosure. So any of those ninety percent of the homes. Yep, ninety yes. percent of the homes and sellers you're going to work with. I'm kind of making up that percentage, but I feel good with it. Um, are going to be not exempt. Which means you have to follow. Which means you have disclosures. You have different forms you need. Again, every so often you will come across that one. Again, concern. I will tell you this right here in the environmental section. Um, when I was with Keller Williams in Annapolis in Anne Arundel County in Southern Maryland, more of the properties were subject to these easements than up here in Baltimore County, Baltimore City, that type of thing. Um, most, again, most of the properties that I see agents working with, especially around this area, um, the property is not subject for conservation easement. This is not a section I would pre fill out. This no, 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 you, you can't pre fill this out. Like, yep. we, we rely on will, this for a lot of information. If they are, if any of these conservation easements do pertain, the seller will know. This is something that this section here, the, the owner will know. And if, and if they're ever like, well, no, I'm not sure. I think I remember seeing something, but that's when you go into the land records again and see if there's yep. something recorded. That would all the way down to the bottom. Burger Company, Kellogg's Legacy. By the way, the burger or authorized representative, that is you. You are the authorized representative. You're not going to be sending this. Not, everybody's not sending things to Doug to sign. You are the authorized representative. You're the agent signing it. And then obviously, any seller who's on the deed, who's selling the house, needs to sign it. Woo! That's the longest one. Oh, the other ones are easy. Yeah, all the other ones are like two, three pages. They're super easy. Let me do this one and then I'm going to turn it over. Is that cool? Because I love this one. Disclosure disclaimer. Disclosure disclaimer is unless they fall into that 1% category where they're exempt, like a estate sale. Disclosure disclaimer is a required document for every single home sale in the state of Maryland. If you are talking to a for sale by owner, even a for sale by owner, needs a disclosure disclaimer that they don't even know about. I don't know what the class will be having during the listing wars in July. Um, here's how I like to explain disclosure disclaimer to a client. Yes. My seller. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so what is this? What is this is also, I do recommend this. This, if you were to bring two things with you, well, three things, bring your CMA, Bring your exclusive right to sell filled out, except for those few sections um, with price and everything and selling instructions. And bring disclosure to school. Everything else can be sent electronically. They're little one off forms, they're easy. People can sign them through DocuSign. And I'd also bring the patient's exclusions so they can check the box to sell them. But that's not. I usually bring that to my next one. Again, we do different, like, different strokes. Yeah, every agent does something differently. That's kind of the fun of it. It's fun in real estate. Unless you're like a really, really like, I want every single thing I need to see, then yeah. you're like, well, what do I do? So pick one, go with it. And um, yeah. And you do, you totally, like, how I worked my, oh my God, how I worked my business my first year versus how I worked second year and third year, totally changed. Totally changed. Everything I've done in real estate has literally changed every year of my business. Every year. Don't marry anything. So disclosure disclaimer, they are either filling out, the disclosure, which means they are disclosing that they are aware of a latent defect, or they are disclaiming that they are not aware of any latent defects. So there's four pages here. The first three pages are the disclosures. 
So I'm going to sit with my seller and I'm going to be like, hey, look, this is the disclosure disclaimer. It's a required form in Maryland. So let me ask you, are you aware of any latent defects within your home? What latent defect is, and this is where I'll read some of them off the piece of paper, right? So I may sit there and read to them, like, for example, um, flooding your roof, uh, any system, operation condition of skipping system, the heating system, air conditioning system, any structural things you're aware of, exterior walls, internal walls, any leaks or moisture. So you kind of give them some, some items you're just reading off the piece of paper. Now he's going to say, Great, skip those first three pages, turn to the fourth. So you are explaining that you are not aware of any like defects. Is that correct? Uh, yes, so where it says no like defects on the channel. No. There you go. Go ahead and check that. Sign done. Great. Now he says, well, I do know that when it rains, this whole thing works. Okay, we do need to disclose that. And he's like, are we sure? Yeah, because you just said it. Now I heard it. So legally, yes, you have to disclose it. Because now it's a material. Fact that the yes, now knows about and by law has to disclose. If they say something to you and now you know it, and they're like, but I don't want to write it. Well, you have to. Yeah. You have to. So all of these yeah. are material facts that would potentially change the value or price of that one. So they, they only fill out if they are aware of something, right? If they're like, yeah, you know what? This one section leaks when it floods. Okay, we're gonna fill out the entire. We will now fill out the entire first three pages, and they, even if they only know one thing, they do have to now go through the entire first three pages, and they'll check no to everything except for that one thing, and then they'll sign um, on the bottom of page three, right? Because they are disclosing. That they're aware of something material, some like defect, something about their house. If they come back to you, again, this is this is why I like to have this as a conversation. If they are unaware of anything, they're like, no, like it's good. Now it's good. It's built like five years ago. Cool. Turn to page four. It says disclaimer up top. The only, the only sort of exception that I've seen a couple of times, if somebody really wants to brag about something in their house, you can kind of squeeze it in with the disclosure. Like maybe they did have a water issue at some point, but now they have beautiful French drains everywhere. And you can write that in, like French drains, it's all 2019. You know, it's not. If you're going to do the exercise anyway, I would go ahead and have like good things about the house too. Not just that. I like that. I've never thought about that. Yeah, I've seen it a couple of times. Oh no, this is actually helpful information. It's like, like, all right, that's that's a selling point. So yeah. So again, it is it is um like Sherry in your room that we put the forms in and your dark side room. One of them is gonna so one of the forms you'll see on the top it says um Disclosure disclaimer. So again, the it, the first three pages are the disclosure part. The last page is the disclaimer part. So you are either filling out pages one through three, or you are or just filling out page four. Right. Do not fill out all four pages at all. All right. I am now turning over. Great. The Zoom and the computer to the one and only Doug. Thank you, Laura. Oh, yeah, good clap. Come on. No, no, nothing at all. Uh, nothing. <laughs> all right. Hey, oh, I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. I So, for inclusions and exclusions, this is another piece of paper that we absolutely do not fill out in advance. And sometimes I'll print this out. And hand it to my sellers the very first time I see them, just as like a homework assignment. This is important because this is what's actually saying what's for sale. This is what's included in the house. If they plan on taking that second fridge, if, the, if there's an old family chandelier that they plan on taking, 
you need to make sure that you put that down here. So if there's something weird that you're including, or if there's something weird that you're going to remove before sale, you need to make sure that it's disclosed here. Yeah. <laughs> what, you, what you do not want is to line up the showings, people get excited, and then by the time the offers come in, then afterwards you're realizing, oh wait, we're taking all the mirrors down and the chandelier and the second fridge, like could be stuff that they're excited about. So some of it's strategic and some of it from a legal perspective, you the seller agent need to make sure that you don't sort of accidentally sell something that they weren't trying to sell. So like if, and, and this is not actually part of the contract, this piece of paper exactly. This is just something for the listing presentation. So they're telling you, the seller's telling you what's for sale. Then you and right, or there's a separate document that you're gonna upload where you're gonna do this manually. And you need to make sure it matches one for one. You're not slipping in anything, you're not omitting anything. So this is just really, really important. And this needs to be uploaded into Bright in the sort of document collection that they're gonna, that the buyers are gonna be looking at. So they know going in, oh yeah, the, the dishwasher isn't, isn't included. Like that's not gonna be a question for them. It's all gonna be, we're gonna be straightforward. There's also the spots for additional inclusions or exclusions. This is where I would highlight if there's anything sort of noteworthy. Like typically in Maryland, the washer and dryer stays and conveys with the property, but not always. If somebody's moving out of state or they're moving it, moving into a place that doesn't have one and they want to take it, I'm making sure that's under the exclusions. Okay, just so that's crystal clear, we're taking this with us. And in fact, strategically, before doing any showings, I would try to have those things removed. I don't want any any questions. Right, that's not always going to be possible, but that's the strategy. You also need to disclose here for any leased items that the seller doesn't own but are on the property. So if there's a propane tank, if there's solar panels, if there's some fancy security system that they're currently leasing, you need to disclose that up front. I also really like this document because this is where the seller tells you, are they on well water? Do they get natural gas? Do they have oil heat? These are all things that are really important to buyers and you can't really, there's no other way to really know except by asking the seller, like, what do you have? Occasionally, they're not sure what is heating the home. So you may have to sort of ask some follow-up questions or give them some homework to confirm these things. So that's all stuff that they absolutely fill out. We rely on them for this and we need to make sure that we're following their representations. Any questions about that? All right, now we get to talk about lead paint. So 1978 is the magic number. If it was constructed prior to 1978, then you need to basically tell them there's a decent chance there's lead paint in here. If it was built 1978 or later, you can actually be pretty darn sure that there's not lead paint in the house because it's completely illegal at that point. And then you don't actually need some of the disclosures in the vendor that, that attach to that. But if you have an older house, this is really, really important. The seller needs to just specifically disclose what they know, okay? So if they know that there's lead paint, they need to check that box and they need to say what they know. If they have no knowledge of lead paint, they get to check this box on part two. If there are any hazards or reports, you need to provide the potential buyer with all available records pertaining to those reports. If you don't have any reports, you get to say that. If you're dealing with a tenant for specific acknowledgements, and same for the buyer. Sorry, do you guys have the documents? Um, that made a weird order. Oh, I'm sorry. Mind, but 
So it says disclosure of information on web based payments. <laughs> okay. Any questions about lead paint? And this is also something that the agents have to sign. So if you look at all the signature blocks, we actually have to sign that. That's how big of a deal lead paint is. So for sure that there is no question that this is here. It's not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you would say. Sorry. But if the house is free of all the it would be this one here. So if it was built before 1978, yeah. you get to check that first bit. Okay. And then you still go through everything. You just gotcha. kind of get to check now. So hey, okay. no, I don't have any records. Okay. I have no actual knowledge of reports, anything like that. So um Before, you can say no. So the agent doesn't have to sign this. The agent doesn't sign that. And, um, there are a couple of lead paint things that we get to sign. We get to sign the contract of sale. We get to sign. And going back to the property disclaimer, the law states that there's a law to protect the buyers from any from the sellers basically hiding something. Like if I have a hole on my floor and I put a pot of plant on top of it, you can't do that. Okay, you you know that there's it's a it's something that's hidden and it's something that's dangerous. That's the definition of a latent defect. If you know there's mold, if you know there's water issues, if you know that there's a structural issue, sellers can't hide that stuff. They have to disclose by law. And if it comes out later that they should have disclosed it and didn't, you know they're getting sued. So this is something you want to protect people. That's our job to facilitate, but also to protect our clients. Okay, so the next one we're going to go to is the consent for dual agency. Has a big sort of like Maryland flag on top. <laughs> okay. So at this stage, we're basically just letting them know that dual agency could come up. And all that means is that. Maybe on the other side, another of the 300 Keller Williams legacy agents might want to try to buy your house. And that would be great, right? We don't want to discourage, we don't want to eliminate 300 people from the buying pool. We want to get as many eyeballs on this as possible. So what this does, it would consent in advance that they're at least willing to entertain offers that are technically from the same brokerage, okay? This form exists because people are worried about a conflict of interest, right? If the brokerage owns the listing and the brokerage owns the buyer agreement, are both sides really represented or is there, is there some sort of conflict? This sets forth that, no, there's not a conflict. Buyer's agents and seller's agents have a fiduciary responsibility to represent them, not the broker. So the broker sort of oversees things and technically sort of owns the transaction, but each one of you is, is a fiduciary for your client looking out for their best interests. So this just, this just sort of spells that out if they have any questions. So you would consent, the sellers would consent to dual agency, just based on the argument that I just made. But then this is such a big deal that if you do then get a buyer that's from Keller Williams Legacy, you have them affirm the dual agency that they already consented to. So they sign this again. This is one of the few forms that you have to sign twice. Just make sure everybody's comfortable. 
So if you see Keller Williams legacy on the other side of a transaction, you just go ding, ding, ding. Okay, I know there's something that we need to sell. Right, goes back to this form. So first you just sign. First box. Sorry, that just really on page two. At first, you're just having them sign that they consent to it, and then if it actually happens, you're ready to accept a contract with a Keller Williams legacy agent. Then you'd have them affirm that to work. Okay. Okay. You, yeah, so that so during the in your listing presentation, you would get them to sign that middle part that says consent for dual, consent for dual agency. But you can't get them to affirm it until it actually happens. So you sort of pre-sign the first bit, and you can actually put that in your documents in the MLS to like broadcast to legacy agents, hey, we're we're open for business. But make sure that if you are a legacy agent, that you get this piece signed. Any questions about that? Okay. So the lockbox addendum is next on our list here. <laughs> figuring out the, the ordering of the papers. Um, this is a long document that mostly protects you and the brokerage, but it's also an opportunity for you to spell out the conveniences of a lockbox, especially if you're doing the century lock. You know, you can talk about all the great security features and then you track exactly who's coming in and you can view it online and, and it keeps a record of all this stuff. But this is also the opportunity to have the conversation. Don't leave all your jewelry out. Like people are going to be in your house. We as agents are going to do everything in our power to protect your belongings. People aren't allowed to be in there without an agent. So you just have the home security um, conversation. So for vacants, would it be best to stay in this I guess you could, but for me, if I have a century lock, I'm using it. Or if I have 10 listings, then I guess I only have nine century locks. Maybe I'll put a, a regular lock box on a, on a vacant property for sure. Um, yeah, but that'll just go to your comfort and we'll be in a case by case. Do you sure do? I know expensive. <laughs> and you can, can you use the same one for different locations like when you finish one house and you have another house yes yes it's not like a use it and lose it so okay. i have a lot of people starting off will have two boxes so that in the event that you have two listings at once right good for you they can be two different places otherwise i just kind of keep them in my trunk I don't remember. I don't want to say the number because I don't remember. Sometimes you can buy them used. Occasionally, GDPR will have them used, and you can just like, I think they just kind of show up, and you need to like be in the office that day to find them. So, elite stuff is a couple hundred percent, at least a couple hundred of those. And the Bluetooth ones are the newest ones, right? Correct. And those and those are nice. I mean, yeah, to yeah. be able to walk up with your phone, and I just like hit my thumbprint, and the thing just opens up like. That is nice to not have to worry. I feel like an underappreciated challenge of realtors mm -hmm. is the ability to open up all the different damn lock boxes. Mm -hmm. Like I like I think I've tackled almost every type of lock box now. It's, it. it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, some more hard to close. Some I had a um, lock box recently. It was my first um, rental. I'm getting started, so it was my first rental. I closed my first line. and so it was the combo line. Uh -huh. And so I went to Century Lock and it was like LSD and I'm like, but that's like, hold on, boy, there's my. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, the, the realtor for the property, she had it showtime. And uh -huh. so apparently it was like within showtime, the code was, which I yeah. didn't know that. So I called her and she said, I put it in showtime. And I'm like, 
Okay, thanks. There's a lot, there's a lot of troubleshooting involved. I've definitely been like squatting, trying to figure out a lock while people are like tapping their feet behind me, trying to figure stuff out. She was um, patient with me. I was the one that was sweating. But... Exactly. Yeah, we, we worry about it more than more than the buyers do. But there's definitely, but there are resources. We can call Shelling Hall. We can call Central Lock. Like it's been exceedingly few times, even when things go wrong, you can't get into the house. Like there are. If the box isn't working, they can sentry lock and give you like a one-time code that you punch in manually, and then you can you can generally make it work. Um, I don't even know. Do you guys get like the sentry lock card anymore? Yeah. I think this is like yeah. I think this just they they had I think like six months ago they stopped doing it. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean it's not something that I would you have to like punch click it in and it like function <laughs> three. It's like very dumb. Um, so yeah, the code the code is what's up. The using the the app is really nice. But you're even with the app, you're gonna find ones that don't have Bluetooth. So you can so, right. So you need to figure out how to sort of generate the code. So it's it's just kind of trial and error and try to practice these things to the extent that you can before you're in in live fire, so to speak, just so you understand how it all works. The so ones like. Um... That I've seen so far, like I just went to go see a house that was on the market. Mm -hmm. So there was one up the street from my house, and um, the code was on the um, the century lock, and I was able to get in. But then I went to see another house, and so mm -hmm. I ended up just calling the realtor, and the realtor said that the house was under contract. So I didn't see that because I didn't check in my last bird. Okay. I was just driving by, <laughs> oh, sure. and I saw the house. So I had noticed that the ones that don't have the number there, it's either probably like under contract already, or either they're like discovered by Showtime and things like when they're not showing up. Yeah, just just be careful. I, we're recording. I have gone into a house like on accident, like straight up that I wasn't supposed to be in, because it was they were literally across the street and they were both sentry lock and. Can just like hit a button that says search nearby houses and you yeah. click on it and like it was vacant and everything was fine it's like oh i meant to show that house oh. like be really careful but using the there's like a find you can search for nearby properties and then it'll use your gps and it'll tell you what's available and you click on the address and it'll give you the code or sometimes i've had to do it I've been on the phone with Central Lock 700 times. So I know this trick now. There's like a serial number on the boxes that, in like the search parameter, you type in that serial number and it'll pull it up, pull up exactly what that is. Then you can request a one time code for that serial number. So there are ways to, there are ways to get out. But once, if it goes on the contract, the agent knows that MLS and they just leave it there. Yeah. So yes. So in showing time, Almost a, almost all your showings will be booked through showing time. You can call, but I never call. You just there's an online application, you click the button, it'll show you all the, the hours that are available, or you click it sends you a confirmation. If it's under contract, by definition, they're not allowing showings anymore. So the link is not active on showing time. If you call showing time, they shouldn't give you a appointment. Now, do we have to pay for Showtime, or is that just free for us to use? Or I've never actually used it, so like for appointments or anything. I think that that's included in right, okay. but I'm not hundred percent sure. Okay, sure. I'm I'm fairly confident that that one's included. Because um, I had my first um, transaction, um, my friend was gone for renting her house, and so I didn't use um, Showtime because I'm not using it. Sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we just did it through um, Zillow, uh -huh. and so um, she had my information there. Okay. So then everybody just pretty much they all contact me. I mm -hmm. respond back to everyone that was through Zillow, and that's how we set the appointment. So that's a pain in the ass. As that's not what you, that's not how you want to run your business full time, right? It's what you'd rather. Showing time is cool when you set it up right. You can set it up so someone requests an appointment. If it's a vacant property, I'll just have it go to me and I'll just approve everything. You can set it for what's called go and show, or once they request it, it's automatically approved if it's vacant. You can set it up so maybe the 
if it's an occupied property and the sellers, they're the ones that want to approve or, or decline, you can set it up so the requests go to them. You can be happy and then they can approve or deny. So it, it's a good service that we offer to our clients and also it makes our lives easier. So I'm, I'm pro shutting down. I think they were just bought by Zillow, so I'm less excited about shutting down now. Um, but they're pretty much the only game in town and they work well. So that's where we're at. Any other questions? I'm not even sure what we're talking about anymore, but it's a good conversation. <laughs> All right, so the next on the list here, and I think this is the last one, is HOA notice. So as a sneak peek, I just recorded a bunch of videos and the training department and coaching, we're gonna put, we're gonna make a whole bunch of these videos. It's basically gonna be like, and this is how you fill out this document. It's sharing the screen so you can watch a five minute video instead of coming to a two hour thing like this, right? So on a, on a case by case basis. So I just did the HOA, I did condo, condo documents as well. HOAs and condos are funny. They, have any of you guys dealt with an HOA or a condo association in real estate? <clears throat> So there's all these protections. So the, the HOA notice here, this is just a restatement of the law in the Maryland Homeowners Association Act, okay? So it sets forth that the seller needs to provide all kinds of stuff to the buyer, okay? The only way the seller gets most of this information, they have to pay the HOA for what they call the resale packet, okay? This is a stack of documents that includes all these things listed here, okay? So they're gonna set forward, forth all the fees and assessments. They're gonna give you contact information for the management agent. You have to disclose if you know if there's any judgments or defaults against the lot. You need to get all this information about the HOA, including the articles of incorporation, which I can't imagine why you would possibly care about. These are important though. You will receive a copy of all recorded covenants and restrictions. Every HOA has a whole bunch of restrictions, which is why people hate HOAs, right? So you can't have pink flamingos in your yard. If you want to paint your door, it can only be these two colors. If you want to put on a gazebo, you need to get approval. But some of the rules really impact how potential owners are going to treat and view the property, right? A lot of people might be buying it as a potential investment property, but lo and behold, the HOA says you can't rent. Okay, that's a big deal. If you have a trailer or a boat and you want to park those things in the driveway, you need to make sure that the HOA doesn't prohibit that. Okay? Yeah. So I have to have a covenant. So some covenants aren't. Um, guided by HOAs, right? All right. So how do we find out if a particular neighborhood has a covenant and like are they still being enforced? So where we have a lot of control and there's procedures in place are for HOAs and condo associations. So the main sticking point here. I'm, I'm going to get to you. I'm going to get to your question and try to answer it more fully, but less satisfactory. Because the next was one of my uh, someone that came across it in their neighborhood, they couldn't have um, any particular aunt always have on sale. Are sure they were not in the HOA? Uh, they said it was a copy. They had a label, like, uh, uh, they only could uh, request their window for a particular style of white house. There are. There's also like historical landmark designations for like older blocks in Baltimore City, where if you try to you can do whatever you want to the inside, but if you do the outside, you need to comply with you know, make sure you use the same style of windows and you don't break the stained glass and you make sure you maintain the marble steps and all that stuff. So that 
There was reference to the environmental covenants that the sellers that the buyer, sellers need to know about and disclose. If it's a historical landmark in a historical district, the sellers need to disclose that to the buyers. If it's an HOA or a condo association, they have to provide copies. And otherwise, there's not a lot of other situations that I could think of that would really change the way that you can live in the house. So this one lady, she said that she she changed her window where she was going to, but then she found out later. So the neighborhood seemed like a um, poor neighborhood. Um, no, probably with the line can yeah, I don't remember what her particular label was. Like Roger Schooler's name. Okay. Probably not much. And she said she found out later that there was some covenant. I bet it. I bet it was a historical okay. designation where that should have been disclosed by the seller. But the seller probably didn't. Or should have been, yeah. So you're you're supposed to if you're in a historical. I looked at one house, it was like, a, it was like a list of landmarks. It was like an old library that was converted to something. And you're basically like living in a museum. Like you can't, you, you can't change anything. You need to like really be prepared for huge amounts of money and upkeep. Yeah, for the, 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 the tax incentives for historical landmarks and the historical designation of certain blocks is probably, it, it's a subject of another class, um, but it's something that we need to be aware of for sure. Um, but the, the reason why HOAs and condos are exciting compared to the historical designations is that it gives the buyers a way to get out of the contract. Okay, so if I receive as a buyer, so I'm under contract, everything's rocking and rolling. I get these declarations, covenants, and covenants, conditions, and restrictions. And it says, oh, I can't rent the property, but I really wanted to rent the property. Within five days of receiving these documents, I can just cancel. And it says, you must cancel in writing, but you do not have to state a reason. It's a get out of jail free card. It is, it's nice for buyers and it's nice for sellers. <laughs> if you're a seller and you are in an HOA or a condo regime, you need to communicate this to your clients that they have this get out of jail free card. And it is terrible for sellers because if, if buyers just get cold feet, they just wait for the HOA docs and they can cancel. No one that they're in an HOA. No one that they're in an HOA. So you just need to make sure that when an offer comes in, you need to review and make sure that there's all the necessary necessary HOA agenda attached for the cut. This doesn't get into condominiums, but there are actually four different agenda that you need to know about for a condominium. There's like the notice which spells out the law. There's a document that the unit owner needs to send to the condo association. Then there's the document that you need that the seller sends to the buyer saying what they have actual knowledge of. And then there's an acknowledgement saying that the buyer received all these things. So it's like the, the HOAs and the condo associations are like highly technical. So you just need to be really careful to make sure. And the, the big, big one to understand is that for the HOA, you have five days to cancel. For a condo, you have seven days to cancel. I don't know why that they're different, but they are. And double, <laughs> double check there. I'm 99% sure that that's right. One of them is five, one of them is seven. Um, so just make sure. All right, those are all the documents on my list. Has anybody come across anything else that they have questions about or any other, anything else generally? So you are ready for your listing, you know exactly what to do.
Okay, okay. <laughs> so then yeah so, th so that's definitely another another class but it's gonna include a lot of this information that we've taken in so you're gonna you go into bright you go under listings you click new listing it's gonna ask you it's uh is it more ground rent is it a waterfront property is it detached and you sort of check all these boxes um you know do you need to set forth do they have oil heat do they have natural gas do they have public well or septic so you need to like be very well versed in all this stuff and then that's what you're going to use to go into the go on the MLS and it's just a checklist it'll it's long it takes a while to put a listing up it's like a little column on the left you just go down check 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 Put down just proper description, you upload all your photos. So, and you want to jump on there. You can like create a sort of ghost listing and just don't, there's a publish button, just don't publish it until you're ready. So you can create kind of a fake listing and just go through and see what what the different pieces are. So you, you'll know what you're going to need to ask when you do get that listing. Um, yeah, and you'll have a little bit of time because like you're going to need. The house always needs a little bit of work, and then you need to arrange photos. Like, there's always a little bit of a delay. Um, so, you just need to know exactly what you need on Bright so you can make sure you have that. And so, if you do a house, um, you can turn card or you pay to like a photographer to prove it or that owner. In most instances, that is a service provided by the seller agent. So, and that goes back to how you run your business and what percentages you're charging, right? If your business model is to be the discount realtor and you think that you can win a lot more listings only charging 2%, maybe you say like, look, I'm charging less, but then I'm not paying for photography. Whereas if you're charging three and a half percent, I'll give you a couple hours of my handyman I'll pay for, I'll pay for staging, I'll pay for photography, I'll pay for pre-inspection. If you're looking at a million dollar house and you wanna really sell yourself, maybe you can do that stuff. But you know, those are relationships you're leveraging, that's money out of your pocket before you get to closing. So um, there's just a lot of different ways to skin the cat and to structure your business and uh, to bring value and that also goes to the flat fee yeah so let's say photography is two hundred dollars you charge a two hundred dollar flat fee and that that covers you how do you go to kind of those different deadlines like once you submit the You, you have to be really, really careful. Um, deadlines are the biggest part of our job. Like, if we screw up deadlines, that's how you really find your clients. There's a financing deadline, or if they don't apply for financing in time, they don't default to the contract. There's all the inspection deadlines, your next days to get the inspection. And you need to get them to repair a report within X number of days, and they have five days to respond to you, and then you have two days to respond to them. You need to keep track of all this stuff. Then you need to get the pest inspection, plus your hounding to make sure the appraisal gets done on time. There's a lot, there's a lot of the contract that don't make the it wasn't so now we're talking contracts. Outside. Now, right now, we're just talking listing presentation. This okay. is the listing. This is how you get that listing. Okay. When, when somebody said, but this is why you take the buyer contracts by us. Okay. Because as you're preparing for the listing, you want to be able to know what you're expecting to receive and whether or not they're giving you A, all the right documents, and B, how they've chosen to fill in the blanks. Are they benefiting? Is it a, a good offer or a bad offer? And it's not always just about that dollar value, right? The do dollars are important. But if you have something that's pretty similar, somebody's, if the, if the buyer really wants it, their number might be lower, 
like a waiving inspections, or there's an appraisal gap that will bring more money to the table if the bank doesn't think it's worth what you think it is, or you're willing to close in 14 days and, and the other guy's willing to close in 60 days. Like there are ways to make yourself more competitive. And a lot of that's going to be relationships. And when I'm making an offer, first thing I do is call the listing agent and say, what is important besides the dollar value? What is important to the to the seller? And if maybe they're really nervous and they don't have a new house yet, and they want a 60-day close, and then they want to rent the house back for another 60 days so that they can find a new house. I want to know that when I'm crafting my offer. If that's important about I'm gonna really cut that hard. If you're like, this property is vacant, I already moved out, I want to close as quick as possible, I'm paying for this house to be staged, I am at, like I just want to be done with this thing. Talk to your buyer, say, how quick can we close? How quick can we get financing? Um, but just playing the game. Anything else? We're all experts now. You're not. Uh -oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, this, this place is great in terms of resources that are available. Call your coaches, come to these classes, wander down the hallway, sit in the little, I call it my broker bunker, my little closet with holes in the wall, but I'm here. So you're here full time in, in the office? Pretty much. What's that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to have office hours at least three days a week, shooting from Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just 11 to 12, so I'll just be sitting out there. Um, but for the most part, I'm either at an apartment or I'm in the office. If I'm in the office, most of the days. So I feel the need to get in touch with them. All right, team. Thank you so Thank much. You but we want a good class. <laughs> They're all good classes. They are, but I've been coming in for something totally different. That's all right. <laughs> Thanks, Sasha. Yeah.